right, so this week we are talking about privacy. So it's kind of along the lines of the ethics stuff that we were talking about uh, previously and specifically thinking about what privacy is and whether it matters. So have any of you guys actually read the book 1984? Um, if you are in the mood for reading a, um, it's a short novel, um, it's written, in, um, well, published in 1949, it's, I actually do recommend it, it's quite an interesting book and you'll suddenly get all the in references to it uh, because it's referenced all the time in, in the media, um, you know, the TV show Big Brother is named after Big Brother in, in the book, which is basically this totalitarian society with the government um, constantly um, watching everyone so there's like a multi-class system and everyone's under surveillance and basically it, even if you have the wrong facial expression then that can be considered a thought crime and it's very the, basically <clears throat> it's quite an interesting um, idea but no one um, in, the, in that society is allowed to have like independent or seditious thoughts it's like against the law kind of thing. So um, I guess the question is how realistic is that now? I mean, the, basically one of the ideas in that book are that these telescreens. So you have this, these televisions in the, each of the rooms and there's like a camera built into it so that they can watch you while you're watching the TV. Um, and in the book, there's like this little corner of his room that he can sit in where he can't be seen. Um, but if you think about it, uh, in terms of technology, we've gone even further than that. Like you can get to the point now where you, you, know, you can actually see all of the activities people are doing online, and from that you can make all kinds of inferences about their ideas and their opinions and all sorts of things. Um, we actually have TVs with cameras built into them nowadays, so if you bought a Samsung smart TV, they often have a camera built in, and um, yeah, I mean, it, we're, we're getting to this point where all these ideas are actually really worth thinking about. And as it turns out, we are being surveilled by government entities more than anyone realised. Thanks, we know that due to the Snowden revelations. Uh, there's a lot more surveillance happening than anyone um, knew was, was actually going on. It wasn't a surprise any individual piece of information that came out of that, but it just the amount was surprising to people. Um, and to the security community, it's just like this, you know, just an amazing amount of surveillance happening. Um, but also, we've got um, corporations and companies and things that surveil everything that we're doing online um, in order to try and make money off, you know, selling advertising to us and things like that. So, my, privacy is quite a complicated issue, and. Um, you might not have really given it that much thought in the past, but what do you guys think privacy actually is? Doing something without anyone else knowing. Yeah, the ability to do something with no one else knowing. Keeping your personal information away from other people. Personal, inf controlling your own personal information. Yeah. 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 So yeah, those things. So the, it's basically an individual's right to selectively share information or seclude themselves. So yes, um, there's the physical side of that. So you know, modesty, for example, being able to like wear clothes and decide to like not, you know, you know, have control over that side of things and um, having your own space. So you being able to like go into uh, your own house and just be able to. Be, be yourself and relax basically without worrying what people are thinking about the things that you're saying or thinking um, and you know the things that you do in the privacy of your own bedroom is no one else's business for example um, and information so for example medical um, information about your own uh, you know health problems you, you know you should have some say over who gets told that information so Say for example, you've got cancer. You don't necessarily want everyone to just know that because you know they might start treating you differently. So you know, it should be up to you to decide who you tell that information to. Um, political, for example. So 
we've all got rights to political ideas, um, but we don't necessarily have to share them with everyone around. Um, and in some cases, you know, you might um, put people up if they knew what your political ideas were and things like that, but you should have the right to have your own ideas about things. And same with the religion and your own opinions about things. So I guess the question is, do people even have a right to anonymity? Do you think that that is something that, so for example, online, if we um, have some kind of message board or a forum, do people have the right to remain anonymous in that situation? What do you think? Yeah, in some cases, yeah. In some cases? Not. The ability to share your thoughts without worrying about someone will attack you over them. Yeah. 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 So, and the, like a really strong example of that would be someone like a human rights activist in China or something. Yeah. Like you have a strong idea about something, um, but if you didn't conceal your identity, then you would be personally um, in danger, possibly. Yeah. Um, and. Um, what are some what reasons that you might want to limit privacy? What, why would it sometimes not be a good idea to allow anonymity, for example? So people abuse the privilege of being anonymous. Yeah. Just on Twitter and things. Yeah, so people can say and act and do things that they wouldn't normally do if they weren't anonymous, and maybe in a negative way. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. Um, and there are some other um, things, like say the previous example about medical history. Well, yes, but if you are applying for insurance, for example, you probably do need to declare all that stuff and you, don't, you can't just keep the fact that you've got cancer to yourself if you're applying for health insurance, like life, a life insurance policy or something like that. Um, so, because you, know, you wouldn't have applied for it otherwise, um, possibly. So there are some um, rights related to privacy, so that's, and it's related to the, these things that we're talking about. So there's the freedom of thought, so your um, right to be able to think thoughts in your head, basically, about whatever you like. Um, freedom of speech and expression, so you should be able to share your ideas and thoughts about things with other people, um, which is kind of like legally enforced in countries like the US, but not in countries like Australia or the UK. Um, so that we don't necessarily have a specific right to the freedom of speech. Whereas in America, um, that is like a um, enforced law. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Mysterious. Uh, pity I wasn't saying something more dramatic and it would that into black. And, um, but yeah. It's a pity. Lost opportunity there. So, um, yeah, so freedom of speech, uh, freedom of association. So, for example, your, your right to be able to be part of a union or a society or a religion or whatever. And also your right to privacy. So, can you think of um, like a difference between security and privacy or confidentiality and privacy? Well, the difference is confidentiality is about. Um, like you need to know, so only having someone access information if they need access to it and being able to stop access to some information and privacy is actually more of a rights issue or a um, human, on a human level whereas confidentiality might be, you know, like trade secrets and things like that which there's nothing to do with privacy necessarily but they are related because in order to remain um, to enforce your privacy, you need to think about security and keeping your private details confidential. Uh, and data protection is um, obviously related to these things. So in the UK, we've got the Data Protection Act, which says, among other things, um, you know how information is stored. If you are a company and you store private information about people, then those people have certain rights in regards to um, the information that you're storing, and also you have an obligation to make sure that information is stored securely. So businesses shouldn't store more than they need to, and they should protect 
things um, actually have protections in place. Um, and there are instances where if you're a um, member of society, you are actually required to produce personal information. So there's the example I gave earlier about applying for insurance. It's also things like taxes. So if you're applying, you know, if you're doing your tax returns or, you know, whatever, you have to de define, declare what all the money is that you're making. You can't keep that private from the government. Um, so as, an ex as just like a little question, if you're a system administrator, do you think it's ethical to read the email of the employees in the company that you work for? And under which circumstances? Shouldn't just read them. So you're saying not just like out of curiosity, but if you actually had a reason, such as security threat and a breach of confidentiality. Yeah. So they they may be, you're investigating something that's happened. They maybe there's a, you suspect they've breached some kind of rule about working there or some some term of condition or you know they're sharing information or something like that. Then yeah, usually when you when you um, start work at a company, you basically the contract will specify these sorts of things. So your work contract will say your email at work. It might even say you should only use your work email, or you should um, only um, it, it defines you know what you're allowed to do, and it will say things like your, your work email is subject to surveillance or you know or monitoring and things like that. Um, Yes, so here's another example of question. So if I've got access to a database for work, so for example, I work at a hospital and therefore I've got access to a medical database, is it ethical for me to look up family members and friends in that database? No. <laughs> no. Um, anecdotally, I um, have uh, an acquaintance uh, who um, had access to some kind of database that they had at work and they would just routinely look up everyone they know. And we were, uh, like, we were at dinner and I was just like totally outraged at this idea. Um, and um, the person couldn't understand why we were so outraged about what they were saying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, obviously it's not okay to just look up people in, um, even if you do that routinely as part of your work. Um, it wasn't a medical database in this example, but yeah. Um, so there are times when you voluntarily sacrifice some of your own privacy. So whenever you enter like a competition, you enter your email address or something like that, you're basically giving up that piece of information in order to enter that competition or maybe in, in order to download some software or some music or something, they might ask your email address. So that's like, that's in exchange for that um, service they are taking a bit of information from you because then they can send you spam in the future or they can contact you in the future about things. So that's like the trade-off. Um, but also whenever you're using a free service online, so for example, if you're using Google or Facebook or Twitter or you know, WhatsApp or Viber or, um, God, I don't know what else, um, MySpace or, um, YouTube or basically all of these services that are online that are great, they give us all access to all sorts of information and things and it, you don't, they don't charge you anything, right? So how, how are they making money? Well, they're selling advertising. So basically it, it's worth um, you know, thinking about that. If you, so if you're using Google and Facebook how much privacy do you expect to be giving up by using them? Quite a lot. Yeah. Most of your personal details. So, and so, how would you expect them to use that information? Selling the products. Yeah. So, in advertising. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, it's it's all about advertising. That's that's their business model. If you're talking about Facebook or Google, 
the, the major um, way that they make money, the biggest way that they make money is their advertising. Uh, how many of you guys have actually ever paid Google or Facebook any money ever? None of you. So it's it's important to remember that you are their product, not their customer. So the customer is the advertiser. They're the ones that are giving Google money. You're their product. That's you're what they're selling, basically. So. Um, it is worth keeping that in mind when using these services and deciding you know, how much information and things you're, you're posting to things like Facebook. Um, and as a consequence, you know, obviously governments um, might have access to that information as well. So um, there's, this is a nice quote from um, Google's um, Eric Schmidt. If you, have not, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. But if you really need that kind of privacy, the reality is that search engines, including Google, do retain this information for some time. And it's important, for example, that we're all subject in the United States to the Patriot Act. It's possible that information could be made available to the authorities. True anonymity is too dangerous. So this is coming from Google. Um, something worth thinking about. So like, what could go wrong? What do you think is the worst thing that can happen in terms of having, say for example, Facebook? You, you put everything about your life in there. What's the worst thing that can happen? Someone taking over uh, like your own life as well. Yeah, identity fraud or identity theft. Or someone takes over your life, basically. Uh, if they have access to your Facebook page and you, you're basically sharing everything, it does make it fairly easy for someone to commit identity theft uh, because all that information they need might be there, especially if you're posting selfies of with your credit card in it like some people do. Uh, <laughs> like some crazy people like that. Um, yeah, any other ideas? You could have like passwords are the same, so you get into one account, so your email address mm -hmm. from them could get to anything there. Right. So if because people have a tendency to reuse passwords, which is a horrible, horrible mistake that people make. Um, that then, um, how many of you guys reuse passwords? <laughs> Show of hands. Uh, yeah, reconsider the way that you're doing your password security. Um, because yes, if someone breaks into one account, or they, or say for example, a um, one of the hosts that you're with. Get, gets compromised and then the password gets leaked, which has happened loads of times in the past with companies like Adobe, um, LinkedIn, um, yeah, it's just lo loads of companies that have had password breaches in the past. So if you were included in that list, and you can, there are places you can go online to find out who was included in the list, but I would suggest you don't go to a website where you type in your email address and your password. Um, but there are um, sites you can use to look up whether um, you know you, your information was included in a breach, but if it was, and you're using the same password a lot across accounts, and then they manage to get your Facebook password, for example, and they get access to all that information, another thing that can go wrong <coughs> is just in terms of manipulation. So this is a big one to do with privacy. So this is a really I really like this quote. So. Imagine that I could telepathically read all of your conscious and unconscious thoughts and feelings. I can know about them in as much detail as you, you know about them yourself. And further, that you could not in any way control my access. You don't, in other words, share your thoughts with me, I take them. The power I would have over you would of course be immense. Not only could you not hide from me, I would know instantly a great amount about how the, inside, how the outside world affects you what scares you, what makes you act in the ways that you do. And that means I could not only know what you think, I could to a large extent control what you do. Um, so that's from a professor of philosophy. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a big deal that there are, you, if you know what someone's thinking, you can basically manipulate them into acting certain ways. So <clears throat> what that means is it's taking away your um, or autonomy over your life in some ways. Um, and the, the problem with these massive institutions that collect information 
and you as an individual is there's this massive power imbalance where they you know can essentially collect loads of information about you um, and potentially wield that over you so you know targeted advertising is like one of the main ways they do that um, but if you think about it a lot of targeted advertising can you could think about it as being taking advantage of some vulnerable people so for example Think, just think about people that have like mental illnesses and things like that. People that are not in full control of you know, their, their faculties. If, if they are being monitored in this way and then they're having advertising targeted at them specifically to try and trick them into spending money, yeah, is that okay? Or even just think about this. If, if they are monitoring you to an extent that you, they can see things like, all right, if I show you this person, if I show you an advert, of this kind of thing at a certain time of the day you're more likely to click on it so for example say you've got insomnia and you stay up late on the internet and you um, just like kind of browse around and at that particular time you might be more um, susceptible to advertising for buying like <laughs> pillows or something yeah, whatever whatever product it is that you've got like this urge to buy more of or something and then at that particular time at, you know after midnight and then hit you with that one particular ad um, and basically they've tricked you into spending money. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. That's what target advertising is all about. But the question is, is that okay? Are we okay with that? With that level of um, manipulation over people's lives? Um, and you know, you brought up before about identity theft and how hard it would be. Well, you can do things like man in the middle on social media. So say for example, you're off someone's friend on Facebook. You could basically clone their profile, create a whole other user that has all of their pictures and everything in it uh, in an account that you create, that you control, and then you could friend people um, using that person's account and you know, do a basically online identity theft. Um, so there's all sorts of things that can go wrong if we're not careful about privacy. And one of the things that makes this even more important to consider is that it's kind of becoming possible to just store everything forever. I don't know about you, but my hard drives just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger as my life goes on. And I've still got stuff from like teenage years. Like, you know, like, so, you know, like I think I've got quite one maps that I created when I was in high school and stuff. So, you know, still just kind of just storing stuff. And that's just on like a personal level but it also is becoming possible for like corporations and things to just store everything for as long as they can because they never know when they're gonna need that. And they, you know, if Google has your entire search history of everything that you've ever searched your whole life from the point of first creating, first getting on Google to, to now, they could know a hell of a lot about you and the things that you're interested in. Um, you know, think about it, what does that digital footprint include for yourself? And um, there's a chance that Google knows more about you than you do. I mean, like, you know, and it, certainly more than your closest friends might know. Um, and all of that information is like stored, uh, you know, on a company's server so that they can target advertising at you. Um, so yeah, again, just just some food for thought and something to consider. So you know, the these, I guess the the reason that that is the world that we live in is because that's the business model of the companies. Um, and basically the way that they make money is gathering as much information as they can. So Google and Facebook and everyone else um, are basically advertising companies, the users of their products. Um, but also that means that these companies are often backing weak privacy laws. So they're lobbying like governments and things to actually reduce the privacy laws because it because they just they get, they get in the way of these companies. So you know it's all about advertising. So some of the things that Facebook knows about you, whether or not you've told them or not, is like sexual orientation, for example. There there's been studies that basically like you can tell from um, with fairly high statistical probability whether someone's gay, do they, you know, on the sorts of things that they like and the thing, you know, what they comment on, the, the you know, for example, um, 
I don't know, just as like a funny joke to them, like ABBA. You know, things like, you know, th there are various things that you add it all up together and you go, well, yeah, probably, you know, one way or the other. Same with drug use. You don't have to specifically um, say, I take drugs, but if you are um, behaving a certain way on social media, you can infer that information. Uh, political beliefs, again, are you clicking on lots, you know, are you liking lots of comments that are kind of left wing or right wing? And, you know, what does that say about you? Um, so if you are liking all the comments where someone like, questions this sort of thing, then whoa, this guy's like, you know, obviously left to field. Um, and, you know, all, all sorts of things. They can, they can kind of figure out what your IQ is. They can tell, they've certainly got a pretty good idea how well you can spell. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's all sorts of information that they can infer, even if you're not intentionally sharing that information. So um, some examples of um, privacy invading technologies is like Google Street View. So when that first happened, people were outraged that Google was driving around with cameras attached to their cars and collecting information. And now we, no one cares, right? It's kind of like one of these things where it first happened and everyone was just thought it was outrageous and crazy and wow, look at all this new technology. And now it's kind of like, you know, water under the bridge or whatever, you know, like it's, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, it's happened now. You can now go onto Google Earth or Google Maps you zoom into the street view and actually look at people standing around shops and things. So, you know, you can do things like this photo here where you've got the sex shop and you can kind of like maybe identify some of the people that are walking past. They do blur faces, but if you have a car parked out the front and see the person, you know, you probably, you know, if you know who they are, it's like, yeah, I know who you are. And maybe it doesn't matter, but maybe you could argue that people do have some right to privacy. But the question is, do people have any right to privacy in public spaces? What do you think? It's not really clear, is it? Like, it's kind of like... Yeah, it's a tricky one. And what about, like, nudist features? Probably wouldn't want Google Street View if you were one of the people on the beach, Google Street View car driving past. Uh, but there are there have been examples on Google where people have like, you know, they're in various you know selling drugs and all sorts of things have been caught on Google Street View and there's like some web pages that collect links to all these interesting things that you can see people doing around the world, um, and um, also Google accidentally collected this is a couple of years ago now accidentally collected all the Wi-Fi data while they were doing this accidentally right. So they, so accidentally, they were, they, you know, to their credit, they did say they'd accidentally done it, and that's what got them in trouble, to be honest. Like, they, and and then so so anyway, they're collecting this Wi-Fi data, and because people sometimes have Wi-Fi networks that aren't encrypted, again, it's a bad idea. But the the question is, do you have a right to listen in on unencrypted traffic? So if I um. For example, went to an internet cafe, and I didn't have a password on the Wi-Fi. It's just an open network. I could just sit there, open up Wireshark or whatever, uh, and just listen in on all the traffic of all the people in that cafe and what they were doing. If they weren't browsing to websites that were encrypted, I could just see everything they're doing. And so. You know, it's kind of like this thing. Well, well, if they wanted to be secure, maybe they should have like encrypted the network traffic. But on the other hand, they obviously they didn't mean to have it unencrypted, or some people don't understand the security ramifications of that. Uh, so yeah, they're you know, again, just stuff to think about. Google Glass. Um, so Google Glass just a couple of weeks ago uh, stopped selling. Google stopped selling Google Glass, but they have said that it's not going away forever. They're just getting the next iteration ready to go out to customers. Um, and there's been questions about whether police should be required to actually wear something like Google Glass because it's basically like uh, like a smartphone attached to your face, essentially. But there's like a camera there and it means you can record everything. And um, I don't think that sounds like a good idea, but you know, people walking around with cameras attached to their faces, recording life going on around them. How do you think you would respond to being, um, you know, someone you knew was wearing Google Glass, would you treat them differently? Just the way you act, uh, 
Yeah. So that's known as the chilling effect. So when you're under surveillance, you do act differently, and you you know you're kind of like you more careful of the things that you say, and it does limit your basic freedom to express yourself when people are, are recording themselves. And there is a name for people who, who have Google, Google Glass. Do you guys know? So it's a glass hole. Uh, so Gmail. Uh, Google actually process all the mail sent to and from um, Gmail users to, to, so that they can target advertising based on email content. Um, this includes inspecting email sent from non-Gmail users. So even if you're not a Google customer and you send an email to someone with a Gmail account, all of the content of your email is now included in that targeting information. Um, so they Google stores all that and uses it to target advertising. Um, and you know that from a privacy perspective, that's like that's really interesting because you didn't actually sign any, you didn't agree to any terms of services, you didn't, like, you know, you're not. But they're saying, well, you're implicitly agreeing by sending an email to a Gmail user, you are basically agreeing that that information is shared with Google because Google is on Google servers. Um, yeah, um, Google obviously store web searches and your web history. Um, you can opt out, but I don't believe it actually changes the fact that they record it, it just changes the fact that they target advertising you based on that behavior. Um, you can use location services so they track where you are. So for example, on my Android phone, um, I've got Google Maps on it, therefore Google knows essentially everywhere I've been. Whenever, I mean, I use maps a lot because I get lost really easily. So, so, so yeah, Google knows all these places where I've been. Um, if you back up your Android device, uh, they store all your Wi-Fi passwords on Google servers. Um, the, the, there's a nice little quote, reality number one, you don't have a Facebook page, Facebook has a page on you. Um, so Facebook can actually track all your visits to any websites that contain a like button. So you know when you browse on the internet and you see these little like button things embedded in websites, every time you visit that page, Facebook records that again. You know, if you're logged into Facebook on your computer, Facebook knows that you've visited all those websites that have that um, tracking um, built, basically embedded into the website. Uh, and there's Graph Search, which is a search engine for mining information from Facebook. There's some pretty chilling examples. So um, you can you can search for things like Catholics who like Durex, uh, or mothers of Jews who like bacon, or single women who live nearby interested in men and like and like getting drunk. There's like you can do some really w weird searches, and um, there's been examples of so social engineering where you meet someone at a cafe, you know, pop on Facebook, da -da 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 -da, and then depending on their privacy settings on Facebook, you can find out a lot of stuff about someone based on um, just you know, information that might be little pieces of information here and there and enough to kind of get more information from uh, Facebook. So, um, social media and employment. So, if you are applying for a job somewhere, there's a pretty good chance they're going to Google you, right, before hiring you. Um, there have been examples um, in the US where employee, employers will actually require you to log, like give you, them your login details for Facebook and they'll actually look through your Facebook history before employing you and they'll look at things like your profile and who your friends are and what your history is um, and actually banks have actually done, they've started to look at ways of analysing your friends to calculate credit scores so they can look at your private, like often it's like publicly um, available who you're friends with and things like that. They can look at that information and basically give you a credit score based on the credit scores of all the other people that you're friends with because the idea is from a statistical point of view you are likely to have a similar kind of like um, lifestyle pattern and things as the people that you associate with. Um, so you know something to um, maybe be concerned about you know so having your social media profile especially public, things like Twitter especially, because all of that is just public by default, everything that you do is shared with everyone. So if you um, go on some kind of rant, that might come back to haunt you like a decade later when you're applying for a job 
and you've at some point in your life you're ranting about some company or something and it happens to be a subsidiary of the company you're applying to work for or something and they're like, no, can't, employ, can't employ this guy. So I guess the, the take home message of that is just be mindful of the, um, you know, what you're putting out there about yourself because it can all impact, um, you know, in the future and um, when you're looking for work. So um, Apple. So Siri, you know, when you press the button and you talk to your phone and it talks back and uh, it can say some really creepy stuff depending on what you say to it. Um, it keeps your data for two years. So when you say something to Siri, it's stored on Apple servers. Um, so all the recorded queries are, are there. After six months, apparently it's dissociated from your account. Um, but, um, also, Apple devices were found to be extensively recording GPS location history. So there were, if you had a Apple device and you looked at in it on the hard drive, it was just this recording of all of your GPS location coordinates over time. Even though, you, even if you weren't using any apps or anything that actually needed GPS information, it just recorded it as you know one of the standard things that happened. And um, you know, obviously, and, and, and actually when you connected, I think it was, so I'm trying to remember now, this, is, this was in the news uh, a couple of years ago now, but if you connected your iPhone to your um, OS X, OS X device, it would like, automatically upload all that GPS location onto your other computer as well. So now you've got all these computers that just store everywhere you've been. Um, uh, there, there have been, um, uh, there, there was a student who refused to wear uh, an RFID lanyard um, so that they used it for student tracking um, and they, they faced expulsion so they were going to get expelled from school I don't think they ended up being but it, you know that was something that, the, that they were threatened with um, you know think about apps that share your location with friends um, and you know how could that information be misused so um, surveillance and law enforcement. So it used to be that surveillance was expensive and difficult. If you wanted to, say for example, I wanted to spy on Craig and know everything that he was up to, that's a lot of work in the olden days, right? I'd need to basically you know, go to the house, look through your rubbish bin, um, maybe open your letters yeah, yeah, and then try and seal them again. and. Uh, maybe place place some actually go to your house and insert some recording bugs around the place and record that and listen back to it listen back through hours of recordings and see if there's anything interesting maybe put you know watch you know there's all sorts of but it's a lot of work it's really expensive it requires man hours and requires people to do stuff but with the IT it's just cheap and easy we can do this like so easily um, what that means is that um, there are companies that already do this. So, you know, like we're saying Google and Facebook and everyone else, they're doing it for their business, right? But now, when a government wants this information, they just approach Google and say, give me the information. You have to, because it's a lot. And that, that, that makes life really, really easy for the government or for anyone who wants to do surveillance or all these technologies. It's just so cheap and easy. Um, and um, the, yeah, so there have been massive surveillance efforts from governments um, where they've over time moved from doing targeted collection to just this broad collection on information on, on almost everyone. So, um, you know, just coming from Australia and moving to the UK, I was just, you know, you get struck by these things where you're in the tube, for example, and it's just CCTV everywhere like, it's just so many i think i'm pretty sure that london is like the most heavily surveilled like in terms of video surveillance city in the world i believe it's just there's just so many of them um and there's just all these listening and recording devices in public spaces uh, nowadays we've got like license plate scan license plate scanners um so they can basically try and automatically detect cars that might not be licensed and things like that but it also means that they can see where people have been um, we've got domestic drone use. So in the USA, they do, you know, they've got basically little, little heli helicopter drones that can fly around, and they can use that to see what people are up to, and you know, 
things like that. And the internet data collection. So, um, the, I think the privacy issue has really been taken off the table, says New York City Police Commissioner. Um, so CCTV was used to find the perpetrators. So they're saying, well, that, that justifies everything that we do. Edward Snowden, in 2013, disclosed classified details of mass surveillance programs to the press. And he says it was to inform the public as to that which is done in their name and that which is done against them. And um, he claims to be a whistleblower because he's telling people about things that were done um, that people weren't aware of and it was for the general public good. But the counter argument to that from like the NSA is that, well, no, you were hired and you agreed when you worked for us that you weren't going to release all this information. So you're basically a traitor to um, our nation because all this information you're giving away is impacting our ability to do our jobs. What do you think? In, in terms of like being in an, an ethical way, you didn't feel like it was right for them to be doing it in the first place. Yeah. <coughs> so that was his justification. But do you think he was right in doing what he did? Well, there were certain things he did which were technically legal for him to do. So yeah. he did broke in the good trap with the public. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 basically, so, yeah. If the government is doing things that, it, you know, if a government organisation is doing things that are illegal and there doesn't seem to be any official way of dealing with it, then maybe that was the best way, that was the best way to deal with it. So it turns out government surveillance is much larger than previously believed. And there's the prison program, for example, that showed that there are companies like Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, YouTube, Skype uh, and Apple. Uh, where they can actually extract all the information from their servers. And um, the, a lot of these companies were outraged when this got leaked because they didn't know what was happening. So um, as it turns out, they basically hacked into a lot of those servers, um, even though they did have, they, would make, they were making formal requests, they also were making, um, like they had multiple ways they were getting information anyway. Um, so Tempora, is operated by the um, GCHQ here in the UK, and it stores large, allegedly, stores large amounts of, inf of internet users' personal data. So it's allegedly shared with the US, and it includes recordings of phone calls and web browsing history, and approximately 850,000 people have access to that data. What Sudo is doing, and to an extent what the newspapers are doing in helping him do what he's doing, is frankly signalling to people who mean to do us harm, how to evade and avoid uh, intelligence and surveillance and other techniques. There are lots of people in the world who want to do us harm, who want to blow up our families, who want to maim people in our countries. That is the fact. David Cameron. Cameron. So, uh, you know, the question is, should everyone be in databases used by law enforcement. Should we keeping? Should we be keeping facial recognition and fingerprints and DNA uh, in order to solve crimes? Um, the, this is a map of the world by Privacy International 2007 Privacy Ranking, and you can see based on the color how um, at, um, how much of a surveillance society they are. And you can see the UK up there in uh, bright red. So. There's all kinds of um, issues around this and it's really hard but not impossible to maintain your, maintain your privacy. Um, it is possible if you know what you're doing to be pri to actually have privacy online. It is possible, it's hard. But, the question, but, but that brings up another question is if people who know what they're doing can have privacy and everyone else doesn't, does that kind of create these two classes in society where you've got some people who just have online privacy because we know what we're doing and other people who just are subject to all this stuff. Um, so, um, in conclusion, privacy is, is obviously a hot topic and this, it's really complicated and this is just scratching on the surface. Sorts of things you might be interested in looking at if you wanted to maintain your own privacy is you know using a third party VPN, um, using um, Tor, although I wouldn't do, um, keeping in mind that the exit node might be able to see your traffic. Um, you know there there are things things that you can do, but if you make use of thing of like 
online cloud services, it can be very hard to keep that, um, you know, maintain privacy. But anyway, um, hopefully that's given you lots to think about and uh, I'll see you next week.